Well, on Friday, the four of us gathered together and we thought, how can we best serve this moment after especially the changes that were unexpected for many of us? And so we realized that there was, we needed to have some time up front to actually help metabolize a lot of what has happened out there right now and to really address the real concerns and emotions. So we opened up to questions from people who had registered from outside. And we're going to have a panel with the four of us first to, to address these questions. And um, I'm joined by the Reverend Sylvia Sumter, obviously, from Unity. Um, this is <laughs> Reverend Rich Toffel of the Church of the Holy City, as well as a founder of the Log Cabin Republicans. And, very active on the future of the right, and Sister Jenna, who is the host of America Meditating Radio and also one of the leading Brahma Kumaris here. So the questions were frankly raw out there. There's a lot of very tough questions, and so we wanted to be real about that. So the first question comes from Sam Guyton in Lakewood, Colorado, who said, how do we respond to or interact with individuals or groups who repeat some of the epithets used in the campaign, which are now being voiced, such as white power, cotton picker, when will you go back to Mexico, and similar phrases? I thought about that question, and what comes to mind is uh, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s statement. He said that hate cannot drive out or eliminate hate. Only love can do that. So in responding to someone who is coming from that low vibration, it will be imperative, the tendency might be to respond in like fashion. But somehow, I believe we're all being called to step it up a little bit. So it might take a lot to, if I'm the one on the receiving end of something extremely negative, to actually then see if I can return light, if I can return love, if I can respond to that from a higher vibration. Um, and that's what Gandhi did, that's what King did, so I think those methods are effective. We just have to get more practice at doing it. I don't think there's much more I could say that was so beautiful and so eloquent. I think that. Uh, is the perfect, perfect answer to a very complicated question. The only thing I would say is one thing that I will be refraining from too in my life because I live in the city, I will be careful about comments like redneck, hillbilly, hick, white trash that are uh, able to use. We've got to stop polarizing each other with these names that we feel comfortable saying. So uh, I think we've got to work on just uh, realizing that the uh, illusion of this campaign is that we are not one, that we're enemies, and that one side is evil and one side is good. That's the illusion. The reality and why this service is so important is that we are all one, and we're all loved by the same God. And so we have to embody that. Spiritual people will need to make this transformation possible. It will not happen in the transactional world of politics. Amen. That's right. You want me to answer? And uh, what's interesting about even declaring ourselves spiritual people, I think, more than anything else, a situation that approaches us with that level of vibration is asking us to test ourselves to see to what extent I'm rooted in my faith. And it could be faith in a particular religion, or it could be faith in particular virtues or values that I was raised with that I just know it doesn't serve anyone to be unkind. So I think, um, and I've been speaking very openly about it, it's such a good opportunity because on both sides, we're learning about ourselves more. Are we going to go into that level of expressing ourselves because there are traces of that inside of us? Or are we going to use it to see if there's anything left in me or have I truly allowed God to be the soul? source in my being. Does that make sense? Beautiful. 
I think these beautiful answers. I would just add to to be really conscious of how we are in social media and also in our own social circles. That it's like people model off of us, and and to to really always be looking for and finding the best in others rather than and diminishing them because it's it's happening on the left a lot right now too. So next question comes from Reverend Lynette in Ocala, Florida. She said, so many of us in the LGBT community are terrified. Any thoughts on how we can move from terror into some kind of peace that is actually real? Rich, do you want to go first? As was, as was mentioned, my background is log cam Republican, so it's a topic I'm, I'm well aware of. Now, one of the narratives of this election was that the one side had to be very terrible and the other side had to be great. And what's surprising for many of you to hear is that the, the person who won is the most gay supportive candidate who won the Republican ticket mentioned LGBT in his speech and had an openly gay speaker. Might not sound like a, much to many people, but it was a big deal, and he, and he thanked the audience that night. So uh, I'm not promising anything. I don't know what's going to happen. We're in uncharted territory. I think we all recognize that. So anybody who tells you what's going to happen next is, is uh, don't trust them. <laughs> We're all guessing. But, uh, but uh, I can just say that, that uh, of, all the, of all the issues, uh, that, that one's the, the candidate was very outspoken and took risks at the convention talking about. I think it's a great, a great question, but it can also be applied to uh, Muslims, uh, women, you know, Latinos. So there are so many people who are, have been called out in this election and, um, and, and are feeling great fear. And I think it's up to all of us to stand in faith and to, uh, that's why the safety pin, I think, is such a great movement and idea, to let everybody know that I value you as a human being. And we have to start speaking that language. We have to start uh, owning that so that that energy becomes the dominant energy in our society. And we're all gonna be fearful for a minute, but we have to be faithful, and you know, so we have to decide, am I gonna be fearful or am I gonna be faithful? And if you're faithful, you're going to trust that everything is in process and unfolding. I think in adding to our capacity of faith, many, many years ago, I think it was about 20 years ago, I started a conversation from gay consciousness to soul consciousness. And what that actually meant is that a lot of times when we when we allow the attachment to an identity to be stronger than our virtues, we always feel like somebody wins or somebody loses. But if I'm gay, I can still have my virtues and be gay, and maybe what emerges is more my virtues than my gender orientation. So I think as well what is actually um, being raised is a very, very important issue that I need to more prove my quality or express my quality as a person rather than just what's my gender. That's not the most pressing thing. So if somebody does call out my gender and say it's less or it's worse, then I optimize my, my truth, my quality as a soul, as, as a being of virtues. And then after a while, it might actually not become such a pressing thing. I have to tell you a joke. Right before election, I bumped into the Trump and Pence bus behind the Meditation Museum. And I could not pass that bus without stopping. <laughs> and I did. And can you believe, after the driver looked me up and down like, this is a different look, I could feel that he had bypassed the image, and we just had a really nice heart-to-heart -heart conversation. And the only thing I said, could you please tell your boss just to make it a little bit more peaceful? <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. I would just add that I think it is so important to cross the divides like that, that uh, I took it upon myself to, to go to the Republican National Convention and the Democratic National Convention this year. And as a progressive Democrat, I first was a little nervous at the uh, Republican Convention. I was, I was there when, when Trump got the nomination. But I had actually some really good, heartful conversations with different people. And so I think it's important not to, it's important to not just hang back from the stereotypes, 
but to, to go beyond. And maybe the final piece, if there is trauma that is getting triggered, to really take the time to work with it with other people, because if it festers, that, that, can, that can really poison things moving forward. So I know a lot of my therapist friends have a lot that's popping in their practices right now. And to really give ourselves the time and space to work with that so that we're not immediately acting out of, out of that, but letting it go through our systems and, and do some deeper healing so we come to clarity. So let's do one more. Laura Madden from Washington said, there's a great need to integrate compassion and spiritual awareness with the expanding political and conscious movement for environmental sustainability and social justice. The divide has only been amplified in this campaign. In the face of this crisis, we have, I think, a beautiful opportunity to look within ourselves and our community to nourish connection through positive impact. How can spiritual leaders embolden this message in the hearts of their communities so that we can find the pathways to common purpose and rise together in an interdependent coexistence? That's such a great question. Sylvia and I have not stopped talking about that, how we are all, and, and I haven't mentioned it to Rich, but how we're all being called to amplify our roles as spiritual you know, representatives for wherever we are in service to. And so where we have been comfortable doing what we are doing. This is a situation or an opportunity now to, to ask us, to test us. Have you upped your game? Are you really here to be in full-time service to mankind? And so I respond to that on a very, very personal level where I really feel that it's important for the soul of Jenna to keep accumulating so much virtues and qualities and love from God that I can hold everyone in that space without feeling that I am getting drained or I am feeling that I can't do it. And so that's where I have um, looked on in terms of my spiritual role. We know the systems, the techniques, what to do, what to say, but to be extremely genuine and authentic as a spiritual person, I feel I have to be in that space fully. So I feel like this time is also calling us to really, really deepen our disciplines and our practices and our sprint principles and know that this is why we were called. Mm -hmm. um, as I said this morning in my, in my, in my service, um, I think we have to stop separating out our spirituality from the rest of our lives that this is not necessarily even a political revolution. This is a spiritual revolution. And spirituality should filter into every aspect of our lives, whether you're working, whether you're sleeping, teaching, eating at home with family, with friends, out partying. Your spirit needs to be present in all of it. And so the moment we start recognizing that and placing that first, I think then the rest becomes easier for us. And it'll unfold in a natural in a natural way. Yeah, we, we're saying that we're spiritual leaders, but everybody here is a spiritual leader because you're being, having a human experience. But when you bring that into your life and unfold that, then I think it makes it better for, for everyone. Um, so we're in a spiritual revolution. This is a paradigm shift, and it's time to wake up. In the, uh, the question of spiritual leadership along those lines, uh, in, in my tradition, we have something called providence, the idea that God is working in your life in ways that you don't know, and if you're open to it, look out. It will take you the places you need to be. And when this whole idea, we, we met here a little over a month ago, and when the idea of doing something after the election, I wasn't sure what the point of it really was so much, and I didn't think we had enough time to organize it, but, but my goodness, Providence had a call for us to be here today, and for all of you, and thank you all for coming here and for those who are watching, because you're lifting, so I really appreciate that. Um, my week, interestingly enough, is tomorrow I'll be with the National Council of Churches, which in Protestant, mainline Protestant is the organization of churches. We'll be meeting at Mother Emanuel Church, and praying, and then we'll be, I'm sure, especially praying for the African-American community. Um, as part of that work, I'm part of something called Christian-Muslim Dialogue, where leaders of both faiths have been meeting. We've been doing it for years, but I can tell you that all of us are now redoubling our effort to stand with our Muslim friends right now. Um, and it just so happens that this week, long planned, I'm traveling to what country? Yes, Mexico. Uh, I've been working there for 10 years. And they want to do a meeting there. And they have a lot of questions. 
And so we'll be doing a question there, maybe something a little bit like this, but more in the, more the business world, but they just have a lot of questions. So I think Providence, uh, if you're open to it, can call you to be a bridge builder, to be a peacemaker, and that's what's happening right now. So I think, as, this, as Reverend Sylvia said, uh, we're all being called to do that. It's not something that leaders do. It's something we're all being called to do. It's a very important moment. Well, thank you all, and thank you all who are out there listening and watching as well. I know you have deep questions in your heart, and I encourage you to have deep dialogue today in the events or with each other. We'll have online opportunities as well.